Great. Welcome. My name is Jonathan Neal. I'm the director of Sotheby's Institute of Art in Los Angeles at Claremont Graduate University. I want to welcome everyone here in the room. I want to particularly welcome my guest this evening, Rona Pondik, uh, who is joining us from the East Coast uh, as part of Claremont Graduate University's Atlantic Lecture Series. Uh, for that, I'd also like to thank my colleagues in the School of Arts and Humanities and the Art Department uh, for producing the Atlantic Lecture along with us at Sotheby's Institute of Art. I'd like to thank my team, particularly as well, Matt O'Connor, Jody James, and Jill Stiegel, and everyone who helps us put these events on. Um, and to everybody who's <clears throat> joined us here this evening, thank you very much for, for, uh, for joining us. Oh, also, also, I want to welcome and thank you, Teresa Condito, also part of my team, team at Sotheby's Institute. Um, so, uh, the reason that we're here this evening is because Rona is joining us to have a conversation. Rona, as most of the people in this room know, and many of the people who are joining us online know, has been showing widely uh, in, in sculpture since the, the mid-80s, even, even earlier, um, but really widely since the mid-1980s. Uh, is based in New York, uh, has, uh, has collected now by a broad range of, of international, national institutions and museums. Um, uh, quite a number of her works uh, grace the, the collections of, of, of major institutions. Um, an award-winning artist, uh, and I think for me personally, this has been a, a great pleasure because uh, as, a, as a, a student in architecture and art history quite a long time ago, um, which now I know to have been uh, right at the beginning of, of Rona's career, the images of Rona's work were some of the first that I was never able to get out of my mind, <laughs> and which uh, which really stuck with me. Um, and uh, and I thought that if there was something to be valued in in art and uh, and contemporary artistic practice, um, if something could stick with you like that, that that certainly gave it value. So, Rona, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Well, thank you for saying that. That's. Um kind of an artist's dream to hear someone <laughs> say that their work lives in someone's memory. Um, honestly, if I say one of the most important things, you just said it. Well, thank you very much. Um, much to your credit. I think um, I, I'd like to begin, and actually we've got images from, from uh, uh, across uh, uh, Rona's or with us, um, but I should also mention that, that Rona is opening a show of new work next weekend at Zevitas Marcus Gallery, um, and, uh, and, and this is work that I've heard Rona describe as, as work that has now come after having jumped off a cliff, uh, which seems to happen in her practice about every 10 years. Could you tell us a little bit about what it entailed to jump off that cliff and, and what brought this, this work in, into being? Um. You know, I always talk really honestly about it, and I just, after years, almost 18 years of making work that needed the assistance of a foundry for the casting, and in the translation of the work, it would mean four hours of commuting on top of eight hours of working at the foundry, and in that year-long translation of the work, as I got older, I thought, this is going to kill me. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. I can do a single piece every once in a while, but whole bodies of work. I'd work for four or five years, and then a year to a year and a half, traveling every single day, getting up at four or five in the morning, getting home seven or eight o'clock at night five days a week and be cross-eyed uh, and couldn't think anymore. And I thought, I got to get this back into the studio where from beginning to end, it's local. Um, and so I started trying to figure out how to make my work in a different material. And because I like to make life hard for myself, I decided to use materials that I didn't exactly know. Um, one material I did know that a lot of the pieces prior to um, the pieces you're talking about that started about six years ago now, um, 
were in a modeling material that's called an apoxy. Mm -hmm. And what's great about this material is that you can model with it, you can cut it in half, you can grind it, carve it, so you get the best of both worlds. Um, that material plus aliphatic resins mm. and acrylics and the new body of work came into being, but not right away. There was at least a two-year period of time where not a single thing was finished and where this piece is called Curly Gray and the curly body is out of this modeling material that, you're, that I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'm not even sure how I make my own work. I know that sounds crazy, but I feel like I think with my hands and I feel my way through pieces where from week to week or year to year, these things just change radically. These, uh, these, these new pieces, I think one thing that's particularly interesting and I've heard you talk about this before, is, is, is the new character of transparency. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, that is a quality of the material, but is something that also recalls for you qualities of painting, qualities of light, and the ways that those now intersect with or interact with certain ideas of, of, of sculpture. Could you, could you tease that idea out for us just a, a little bit more about the intersection here between, between painting and sculpture as you see it happening in these new works? Because I think that there's, this, that's a real, it's an interesting change from, sure. from, the, from the work that's come prior. Well, if you go from this image and just go to the next two, like that, and then go to the next. This is not photographically altered at all. Mm. That actually happens as you start walking around this where the form almost completely disappears and you just get all this crazy color and the color spreads depending on how the light is hitting it. That doesn't normally happen in an object mm. like this table will right. never have that kind of alteration of its surface, it's almost like the material is dematerializing mm. in front of you. Um, and when I started seeing this happen as I was working, I got incredibly excited because I thought I've never worked with material that could do this. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you, there's When you say that, <coughs> Excuse me. The, when it's dematerializing, there is a sense in which some of the high polish works. I'm trying to find one in particular. <coughs> For example, here. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember if this is this is not muskrat, but it's no. This uh, is the bat, the rare end of <coughs> prairie dog. That's right, prairie dog. But the high polish surface, the um, mirror finish. Yeah, the mirror finish almost anticipates that right. transparency, right? I mean, in, in a way that, at least from the image standpoint, or if you're in the room with the thing, it, it is at once object, but also sort of bleeds out and brings the room into place, brings you into place, and sort, right. of, sort of captures everything else around it. Was, was, that a, was that something that you were working towards with these? with the mirror finish pieces, or is this now in retrospect from the standpoint, let's say, of some of these works, a kind of happy analog? I, th I think there's a relationship between um, how I'm dealing with surfaces or how I work with parts of things that have one kind of reality and then another. Mm. The I think in the metal pieces, the parts that are my from my body um, that have the skin texture that is more matte actually functions at a different speed than the animal bodies that have the mirror finish where 
they almost feel like they're melting in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a relationship in terms of how they both dematerialize. That's one of the reasons I liked the stainless, because it felt as though it was in transition. It was in flux. It was moving. It was not a fossil. This is a very different material, but has somewhat similar characteristics. Right. Um, yet, if you think about stainless and you think about acrylic and plastics, they're, at, I think, polar opposites. Right. But I, but I love the fact that you said that because the so much of the of the of the stainless steel work, especially when it's juxtaposed with the um, the body parts. I want to find one that's got a good kind of close up. Apologies for just rushing through these, but for ex not so much those here. Um, there is this. There's this characteristic of of a body that's in potential, mm -hmm. right? So there's this. So so both the the kind of the the metal appearing almost as if it's a, as if it's something of an arrested flow or like a like a um, like a like a ball of mercury, mm -hmm. right? Which has that kind of that surface, but could could continue to 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 morph and take on new form, and then it's sort of and then it's becoming into these these bodies that then have the texture and the sort of fully articulated aspects. And when you're when you've been talking about the new work with its transparency and its fluidity, I can't help thinking of this that there's this continuum that really carries through. Oh sure. Um, <clears throat> and so I want to ask you about that because you've described your sculptural practice, or you described sculpt sculptural practice in general. <laughs> in kind of two paradigms. There's, there's modeling and there's carving. And it seems to me that, and, and maybe this is right, maybe it's, maybe it's not, but, but your work is, is, as you said, it's always been modeling. Right. right. But it's modeling that is gesturing towards a third type of form making, which is the organic growth, mm -hmm. right? The type of form making that is neither carving nor modeling but it's kind of intensities and potentials, the way that a uh, seed becomes a tree or an egg becomes a body mm -hmm. out of these kinds of fluids and flows and these structures that are invisible and that you know, they, don't, they don't exist in minutia and just grow bigger, they, they, they develop, right? And I'm curious to know if, that, if, that's, if that's been animating in the background for you of a way of thinking about sculpture because even, even these, and I'm sorry, I know I'm, I'm talking a lot here for a moment, but I've just been, been sort of consumed by this idea. Even some of these works, like the trees, mm -hmm. um, where, the, where the, the body elements are growing out of these fabricated organic systems or these others with the, the small heads that are coming, you know, there's this sort of almost this desire to kind of grow the body, mm -hmm. to get away from the sculptural paradigms of carving, or modeling? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, th I think about um, Apollo and Daphne right. by Bernini. Right. You have all of that coming together, you know? You have the body, her hair turning into growths, right. leaves coming out of them, out of her feet, her toes. You know, if you think about imagery in, in through all the periods that we ha know of, we've had mutation from one life form to another, mm -hmm. one reality mm -hmm. to another. There's, I think, constantly the shifting from one reality to another. I think we constantly try to understand what that reality is. And is it reality or fantasy? And where does fantasy end and where does reality end or begin? I mean, these are all questions that are fantastic. And I talk about that and I'm thinking about the Redon prints mm -hmm. 
where there are these amazing amoebic-like forms that are spiraling and they're turning into human-like shapes. Um, I, I think this tra travels through so much of creation that artists have dealt with. I'm, I'm not particular, you know, I'm not unique here. I think this is something that's happened in history and has been played with all the way back to the Egyptian times, you know, where an animal part joins with a human body. That's interesting. Because there's, there's, there's this kind of, there's this lineage of, and here I wouldn't want to just call it sculpture, but there's a kind of lineage of form making. There's a lineage of, of, of figuration and representation that goes back to the Egyptians, right? They're, and what they're making is not understood as like, oh, we are making sculptures, right? It's like there is a, there is an, a, there is an attempt to register these kinds of, um, I want to say primordial, but, but, but trying to, to reconcile these kinds of challenges of, of, of thinking, which is the, the organic and the organic, the, the human and the animal, and the, the mythical and the, and the, and the mundane. Um, and I think that, that your work in, in very compelling ways links up with those histories. And I think this was the, the images, the, pro the project from, from Worcester, mm -hmm. the Worcester Museum, makes a very compelling case for that when, when you've got your work in juxtaposition to a number of these, both works of art, but also artifacts of, mm -hmm. of, of prior eras and, and these attempts by craftspeople to, to, to understand the world through this kind of figure, figuring. But then there's this other question about, about that I think Bernini is kind of working on and some others are kind of working on, which is how to, how to overcome material, right? And how to, and how, how to you know, there's, there's a modernist strain of that, which is like, we will make sculpture that will then sort of, through its, through its materiality, become illusory and become something other than itself, right? Be become image. Um, and then there's the opposite side of that, which is through materiality, we will make we will make something that can be nothing other than its materiality, and so in its factual existence, states itself as nothing other than what it is, and yet it is still sculpture, not just yeah. a lump of steel on the ground, um, which it has a tendency to be sometimes. Um, so, I, I, how do you how do you see? I mean. I know you describe yourself as someone who's dedicated to materials, loves materials, you know, is a materialist through and through. I'm a material holic. Materi yeah, material holic, exactly. <laughs> um, material filling, however, however the, whatever <laughs> word there is out there. Um, but there is still this sense that there's a kind of a, a, an, an overcoming of that material, or the sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, the transfiguration of that material into this kind of primordial mm -hmm. lineage of, of transformation, right? It can't just be the material. Well, you know, it's an interesting question because I think it could be a battle or you can sort of give over to the material where you try to understand the properties of the material. What are the characteristics? And when you start to understand, or when I start to understand the characteristics of the material, that's when I'm working with it in a fluid way. There are times where I'm trying to understand a material and I realized I have an idea of what that material can do, and I'm, I'm at war with it. Mm. I'm not really, really understanding what it will let me do with it and how I can really sort of like run with it. Once I kind of figure it out, you know, then it almost feels like it's like water, no matter what material it is. Because then I understand it and I can really, it's like I can almost feel it breathing 
mm. in a weird way. And so it becomes just like an extension of me and I feel very comfortable with it. But there, I'm not gonna lie about it, like the new materials, it took me almost three years to get to the point where I really understood what was happening with it and how I could push it and push it in ways that I had not seen it actually be used in this way. Um, and that excited me, that I finally got to understand it and I could really start to kind of do crazy things with it. What does it feel like when you're at war with the material though? Oh, it's really awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. Um, it's awful because there are times, um, my husband's in the audience and so he can attest to this. There are times I get so frustrated, I will throw it, I will cut it, I will smash it. Um, I get really angry at it, you know? And is that because it's not, it's not doing what you want it to do? Like you're not able to? It's a baby tantrum of like me just, I'm not, you know, I can't control it. And so it's like, oh, I'm gonna smash the thing. It's, uh, this, I mean, this is really fascinating because there's this, because you are then when these pieces, let's say for, once you have mastered the material, You've mastered it to a point where you have you have always imprinted yourself strongly on onto it. the material, right? There's this kind of once it's once you've domesticated it <laughs> in some way, or or once you've or once you've civilized it, you civilized it through this this because it's a reproduction of, of yourself in some way. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is. This, and uh, this, and it, you, this, like, ex, you, it becomes literally an extension of yourself. It a, it absolutely is. But you know, the the funny thing about this process is that when I think back to when I was trying so hard to understand it, work with it, and put my imprint on it. There were moments where, honestly, I did, with this material particularly, I thought it was hopeless. I just was not succeeding. And I was doubting myself because I kind of pride myself on being able to pretty much, whenever I have a new assistant come in, I always say to them, don't worry, you can't destroy anything because I can fix anything. So don't be uptight in mm -hmm. the process of us Working. Working. I couldn't fix this. Right. No, matter, no matter what I did, I couldn't get parts of it to work together. In part because of how different my approach was in working with the material. But so then where was, was there some sort of, was there a aha moment? Was there a breakthrough moment where? There were three haha -ha moments. Okay, what were the three haha -ha moments? <laughs> Well, the first was um, because there are the pieces that are more standalone pieces, and then there are the ac acrylic encased pieces. Um, and then there are the partially encased pieces. Mm -hmm. um, there were ha-has of when you have transparent and translucent surfaces, how do you put them together, you know? How do they stand? I don't want the system or the internal structure to show. So does that mean there can't be an internal structure? How am I gonna join these things? That was a real head scratcher that took me close to four years to figure out. Um, the embedding was a big um, issue and, and technical question. Um, there were just so many questions. But then what was happening that was exciting for me was all the technical questions through doors open once I solved them in terms of what happened with the imagery. And what happened with how things felt like they were floating or partially floating or drowning and then I just loved all of what it suggested 
And so it became kind of magical in what metaphorically could happen. Mm -hmm. So it's like technology and metaphor is not exactly something you imagine coming together, but for me, did. Or the fact that, you know, that's just tape making that corner, but I loved tactily what it was doing. So I started incorporating some of the things that were mistakes, because my mold just broke open, and we had to tape it, otherwise we were gonna have gallons of material right. all over the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and I liked what it left. So that, uh, I think that's very important, this, the, the level of, the kind of experimentation that inevitably has to take place, but quite often takes place prior to a final work, right? I mean, I think that yeah. some, of the, some of the earlier pieces, um, you know, there's such levels of kind of finish and polish and, and completion that you wouldn't, you, you know, you pres presume that so something that would have happened earlier, you would have seen some you know, blemish or a, a say, we've got to do it again, or we've got to mm -hmm. get rid of that one. Is it, is it this material that's allowing a kind of give and, the give and take for the happy accident, for the sort of the working, the kind of collaboration with material more and allowing for it to kind of impose its will a little bit more back on you than you would have allowed for in, in, in earlier works? No, I think there's a similar kind of back and forth. It's just, it shows more in this. Um, I think the hand shows and the process shows more. Um, in a lot of the tree-human hybrid pieces, I was forced to have to invent a lot more than I thought I was going to because I thought I was translating the piece, but in the translation of casting it, I lost half of it. Mm -hmm. So what do I do with half a sculpture? Well, I've got to remake half of it out of welding rods because, you know, I just lost it. Um, it doesn't look it, right. but it's there. I think the interesting thing about metal is that because of the way I was working with these pieces, even though there's thousands and thousands of hours of modeling and carving before I even go to the foundry, and then in the translation as well, the hand doesn't show in the same way as it does here or also in the works that are earlier before the animal-human hybrid pieces. Um, and I think that's an interesting thing, like when someone looks at something, whether there's the obvious hand being in work and then there's the non-obvious hand, but there's still a lot of hand in the work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, Sculpture's an odd duck. It's not like painting in the sense where in painting, if something feels like there's hand, it, it's very understandable. Then there's painting where it is more polished feeling and so people say, oh, there's not as much hand. But maybe there's more hand, Right. you know? It's not always what you think it is. In sculpture, it's, it's it's more consistently hard to see. I'm curious about boundaries because some of your some of your earliest work. I mean, I think that there not just boundaries between, say, the hybrid, the, the animal and the human, but the I think you now particular the, the little bathers and some of the, the, the teeth work. There was mm -hmm. a there was an interest early on. Sorry again, I'm skipping through all of these works very fast, which is very unfair of me. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll have to deal with it. Um, <clears throat> Could you imagine if I made all that work that quickly? <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a. I, I remember thinking of the the early work, the the teeth, these these chairs. Um, the shoes a little bit, but there was a, there was a, there was a certainly the, the the milk bottles and the nipples. There was there there was a 
they were all representations which, or, or figures or objects which implicated a kind of internal space, physical internal space, right? The, in, the inside of the mouth, the inside of the body, not just the kind of metaphorical interiority of, of mm -hmm. sculpture. And I think some of that was what made these so um, off-putting in a way, right? That there was a, I mean, maybe even maybe even thinking now the the, the shoe aggregates that there's this the kind of the inside of the shoe, or that mm -hmm. you know there's there, there's a there's an internal space that is not just imagined, right? Mm -hmm. That it's felt or mm -hmm. that it's visceral, um, which then you know again is, is is one of these threads that I see tr translated through the work in different in different iterations this kind of way of, of navigating that that boundary between inside and outside which is often that kind of boundary of eroticism fear uh, uh, disgust mm -hmm. um, and you know, particularly with the uh, with the the teeth works, just just so sort of biting. Yeah, I mean, I don't like. The, there's a great anecdote that you that I'm gonna ask you to tell again for our audience here about the genesis of the of the teeth works. But then I'm gonna say that it, that, that that's not even what somehow it's not even the biting that I find to be so visceral about these works. But it, please tell us how how you describe the the the, the genesis of, of the teeth the teeth works. Um, what Jonathan's talking about is I told a story the other day about um, being on a panel at the Whitney Museum and it was a very large audience and someone asked me why I had started using teeth in my work and I panicked um, and I really panicked and I, I sat there for a few minutes going, fuck, 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 fuck. I don't know what to say. And before I knew it, in front of 200 or 300 people, I said, when I'm angry at people, I want to bite them. <laughs> and I wanted to see what would happen if I channeled it into my work. And then I sat there thinking, oh my god, what did you just say? <laughs> This woman walks up to me at the end of the panel discussion. She must have been like 5'2", bluish hair, prim suit, dead faced, not laughing, not any bit of irony. And she says, when I gave birth to my child, I wanted to eat it. And I went out and bought a suckling pig the size of my child, and I ate the whole thing. <laughs> now, I sat there thinking, they tell us that artists are weird? <laughs> Sorry. No. No. I don't think so. So, so do you still associate these works or, or put it this way, maybe you never did. Maybe that was just the first thing that sort of came to mind when you were faced with the I know, I, question. Actually, I actually do want to bite people. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, it, so, cause it's, but when I see these, I guess, for me, again, teeth are this kind of strange piece of the human body that are kind of, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're both, again, they're both kind of inside and outside. They belong... Absolutely. They belong to the body at the same time that you know a whole set of them go away, right? When you're mm -hmm. when you're when you're making these transitions in your childhood, and so there's these things that you kind of get rid of, not the way you get rid of hair or like fingernails in the same way, but like this sort of integral thing. And you know, people have anxiety dreams about losing teeth, or you know, there's like horrible stories about you know, there, there's a there's a great there's a great section in in. Uh, um, Martin Amos's memoirs about you know having to go through like horrible horrible teeth uh, surgery and 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 walking up Madison Avenue in the 1970s and this this you know missing like half of his palate and the wind blowing and have his lip humiliatingly blow around you know like there's this there's something about teeth that are that are so kind of 
intimate but also foreign another thing that you can't control that you hurt I mean it's like and that was for these 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 works the these the the little bathers and the the especially these with their kind of overbite and that's like more you know toothy less mm -hmm. less grinning and more you know these these are kind of grinning at me I always feel like and these are just like you know <laughs> like someone's teeth there this, this like they always represented this this kind of you know, terrible and wonderful uh, um, dis distillation of that, of that, of that trans, of that transformational space, this liminal space between inside and outside, yeah. that is represented in a number of places around the body. But here, it sort of really stuck with me, and also multiplied with seriality in this kind of way that 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 echoes a bunch of things that at the time it, it would have would have really kind of clicked. Um, is when you when you left these when you sort of left this behind mm -hmm. um, which parts of it did you take were you taking with you right were you I mean I think that that color and surface come mm -hmm. but there's but you sort of you leave behind some of the sort of this interior space the sort of the gap to the internal uh, of 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 what you're making, and it and it and there, it, it almost closes off, and I don't know if it closes off with the with the, with the tree works or it closes off with the hybrids. with the hybrid animals in, in a way you know some of these, but it's like even even the even the faces right even the even the even the objects that would have a an opening or a cavity or the mm -hmm. that moment of internal and external go away. You know, it's an interesting question, and honestly, the question is making me actually think about my own work a little differently, <coughs> which is interesting because I think of the teeth pieces in a very psychological way and visceral way that for me is no different than almost any body of work that I've made. I see them all connected. One, because I know that I always want you to feel my work in your own body mm. so that when you're looking at it you feel it physically and viscerally so that's to me the inside I never thought of the inside the way you're describing it which I see for the first time though which is interesting and when I your think mind's of, just very dumb and literal <laughs> no it's it's an interesting way of looking at it and and this is the thing that I love about being an artist when you meet someone or you read something that's written and you go oh I didn't think of that or see that but it's there um, and what you're saying is is true it is there um, you know there is something more internal in those pieces and I'm not exactly sure if I can describe why. Um, versus the hybrid pieces are, I think are internal, but they're internal in a more symbolic way. If, do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's almost in a more cerebral way that it's internal. Um, or locked in time. Um, but also still oddly off-putting in ways that are similar. I had this collector very early on say something to me that I've never forgotten. He said, your work for me was like my experience of eating oysters. <laughs> I could not get a palate for them at first. I hated them. But once I did, I can't get enough of them. <laughs> he said, I can't get your work out of my mind. It, sort of, you know, firmly places itself in my mind. Um, and I've never had an experience like that. And I thought that was an interesting way to describe it. Um, and kind of a little bit the way I want my work to function. I don't want it to function on one level or you get it like that. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm, I'm a failed artist <clears throat> if you got it. Yeah. I want it to slowly, in a layered way, change and evolve and be organic and go back to what you're talking about. This kind of organicness 
is I think in probably every single piece that I work on. And I keep pushing it until it has a lot of layers to it. But then at the same time, I don't want it to look labored on. Do you know what I mean? I don't want it to look like, oh my God, she put a thousand hours into this. No, I, I, they almost, there's a, there's a sense in which, I mean, particularly some of these hybrids where the, the animal piece looks like un, uh, not yet formed, mm -hmm. right? Uh, incomplete, not, and it's not, not abstracted, but there's a, there's, a, there's a character to it also, this kind of the, the strange uncanniness when you, when the, the first time you see a, you know, a, a, a skinned animal, like a mm -hmm. skinned rabbit or something mm -hmm. where you're, you, know, you still have the same contours of form, but you're missing all of the surface attributes of recognition, and so that it's this uncanny thing that's off-putting, not just because it's a skinned animal, and so on. inevitably you think about your own physicality, but, but here with the high polish, you know, you remove all of that, you remove everything that's almost animal about it, and, it's, and it still exists as this kind of like in potential mm -hmm. piece. And I guess in, in, from, from my perspective, that's, that's almost the kind of this, this odd kind of internality, right? It's like the, the things that are not yet complete, mm -hmm. right? Or, or the things that are not meant to be, that are not meant to have an outside surface or the things that are both, you know, not yet born, not yet, not yet complete. Exactly. Um, and yet here they are, mm -hmm. and then they transition sort of very subtly and very quickly into these, into these external surfaces and forms that we're very familiar with, and the speed with which that transition happens almost feels like this kind of, and I, you know, not to, to use a sort of cliched art historical term, but this is kind of like that abjected thing, mm -hmm. right? This thing mm -hmm. is being sort of, you know, pushed out, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, so here. You know the the face and the hand end up being these like those are the abject forms, right? Those are the things that are being kind of like forced out, whereas this in, this impotential form is something else. Mm -hmm. And then the newest work ha takes that it almost returns that internal mm -hmm. piece to the practice. I mean, like now, like now. You again working with transparency, but now that the, these are you know your face has now been reenveloped, your head has now been swallowed back by That's the material. Right. It has been, yeah. And is and is and is it, and it is now the internal dimension. You know, it's interesting because I you know it is my head, but it's not my head. Um, and what I mean by that is I kind of think of my body and the way I use my body the way a dancer does. It's an instrument, mm. you know? And whether I used my head or somebody else's head, I don't know if it really is, would make that much of a difference. The same way that I, when I was using the shoes, I thought of the shoes as a stand in for the person. I kind of think of as my head or something that some people do or don't know is towards the end of the teeth pieces because my rubber teeth were discontinued that I was using. I uh, had to make molds of my own teeth because what I wanted to use no longer existed. So I used mine, and it didn't make a difference whether they were the rubber rotting yeah, teeth yeah. or the chattering teeth or my teeth. You know, they're teeth. But it, but it, but it makes a little. It, it has a difference. There's a, there's a. It registers differently. It does, maybe or or not. I mean, if I took Robert's head or your head, and I removed the hair the way I have in this, and you were now cadmium yellow encased in the acrylic with the green. I don't know if we would look at your head that more differently than we would my head. Seriously. Except that it's always been your head. It has, <laughs> it has, it has. But well, my God, what I've done to my poor head. You know, 
Um, it's not only its scale has changed, I've lost my ears sometimes, or I've changed my chin, you know. Yeah, you've, you've, you've been, you've, you've taken liberties. <laughs> I've done a lot of plastic surgery. Um, I want to I wanna just ask a couple more questions, uh, and then I, I want to open it up to the audience here to ask some questions as well. Um, and this always seems to, this seems to have been the case. Is we're leaving uh, leaving kind of art history to to the to the end, which I think is okay because there is a way that your work seems to call out for connection to a different history of art rather than the one that you're, you're most mm -hmm. immediately um, uh, related to. I'd say with with your own history. But I'm gonna I'm gonna very unjustly flip all the way to the beginning because this was the f first first image that I'd seen um, prior. And I would love to know what your relationship was to Richard Serra and Rauschenberg and ah, the and a kind of interesting and a, a, a kind of moment that I think was was part of your immediate prehistory and that you must have some position towards, especially with oh, early work like this. I do. Um, love both, love Rauschenberg, love Richard Serra, um, and interesting that, so when I was, this is called Leadbed, and when I left graduate school, the first few years I felt like I was just like bouncing around, hitting the walls constantly, trying to figure out who I was as an artist, what I was as an artist, what made me tick. And I kept hearing all these voices of my teachers that were all minimalists. Um, Richard Serra was someone that I was fortunate enough to actually study with for a short while, and he, was a really unusual person. And most people are surprised to hear this when I say this, that he was actually very open to lots of different ways of working. Um, but I remember thinking imagery was so taboo at the time. And I remember going to see an early Rauschenberg show at MoMA, and I have no idea what year this was, but it was it, around the time period that this probably was made. And I remember seeing the bed painting, and I remember thinking this was one of the most like amazing images to me. And I started realizing, think about the bed. The bed's where you are born. Mm -hmm bed is where you have sex, it's where you're sick, it's where you die. You spend hours on the bed reading or watching TV. You probably spend more time in bed than you do anywhere else. And I thought, wow, what a charged, charged image. And I thought, I'm going to start making beds, but my beds were a little bizarre and <laughs> more different um, and I found that more taboo the fact that I was moving towards imagery away from the world of cubes and you know work that was minimal and non referential to me this was the most like, do I have the nerve to do this? You know, I think about all the things that I've done in my work, and I think that was such a taboo, and it's interesting that we become slaves to what we think is important and what we can and what we can't do. And I remember at that moment when I was, like, struggling with this, and, if, and then a few years later, that this idea that you can or can't do something doesn't belong in art. <laughs> it has no place. If anyone ever says something to me like you can't, I think to myself, oh, you've got it wrong. <laughs> it's, it just doesn't work that way. 
because art is about a kind of freedom, you know. It's about going into places that are not okay to go or to make things that seem like they're one way, but at the same time, they're the opposite. Um, to me, that's the exciting thing about art, that you can do that. Questions from our audience? In the back. Um, I guess it might be more than your work, but it can relate to your past pieces. How do you choose <coughs> the colors that you're using for the cast? Like in the new show, you have more vibrant, brighter, neon-looking colors. How do you choose them? You know, uh, for the first couple of years, um, I had bins and bins of heads in just like 50, 60, 70 different colors of different values, different translucencies. And I was just playing with casting the head in as many different colors as I could just to see what the properties were and what happened to the head. Um, and then it went so far as to, oh my God, when I do the head in this color, not only do I see completely through the head, all of the features completely disappear. And so there were so many things that started happening between the color, the form, what you could actually tangibly see or not see, that I was like, well, what if I try doing this or that? And I didn't even get into doing anything. I spent a year just casting heads in different colors. Um, and it, it was wild because I went into palettes that I just, like magenta. Magenta is not a color I had ever used before. Um, and so, and what happens with the color to me is just very exciting because I felt like the color felt psychological, which is something I had never thought of that just a color could be psychological. Um, you talk about this kind of struggle and almost conquering of materials that you aren't um, familiar with. Once you, I guess, for lack of a better word, conquer that material and understand its properties, um, do you almost find that you want to use it more often and like stretch the limits of it and like see how you can manipulate it in different ways? Or do you kind of get excited to find a new material that you're almost um, unexposed to yet and like want to conquer? That's a good question. Um, you know, Usually I move on from a material when I feel like I know what I'm going to do before I do it. Or I feel like I've said everything I can with it and then I'm in product making land and I hate that. Um, Why? I just, I don't, I didn't want to be a designer, I didn't want to, I just I never wanted to work for someone. <laughs> I know it's a horrible thing to admit, but <laughs> I... Perfect. Plenty of people don't want to work for uh, anybody, that's fine. I like the freedom <laughs> of going in and it's my world and I'm in charge and I can do what I want or not want and it's all me. The freedom of not meeting demand. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. I want to say something that might sound a little standoffish, but I'm not eaten a pig with suffering, <laughs> so it won't be that bad. But I'd like you to talk to me about time. Could you go to the pieces that are like half human, and, you know, like high polished against the skin, hands? Or... Okay, so that, that, go there, there, okay. So <clears throat> I'm wondering, because you've been working for so long, how your sense of time has changed, you know, as you're aging, and... I'm not aging. 
So I had a baby that um, I lost at 19 weeks in utero and held him in my hands. And one term you cannot use is um, embryonic. And it seems so embryonic. They are. They are. And you said it like without using that word. Yes. You talked about transformation and uh, changing and underdeveloped mm -hmm. and all that. And the abrupt change between the stuff that's underdeveloped or not finished and might go somewhere, it looks wet and fluid. Like I could blow it and it'll be like blowing onto wet paint. But it's not. And then to abrupt change to the fully developed hand with the skin follicles and you know, if, if that were real I'd see little hairs. So I'm just thinking about the jump in time and is it ending one thing, starting something else, overlap, you know, like how, talk about time. I think that would be really fascinating. You mean in time in terms of the evolution <coughs> of a piece or no, bodies? When they were, do you think of time is time? I, don't, I no. know yesterday you said time, that with your work you don't go in a linear movement, that you kind of weave back and forth. First of all, I'm like a, a happy dyslexic. So, and I mean that, I'm not kidding around. I have a hard time focusing on one activity. My husband and I have a joke and he'll say to me, you gotta stop, look at me, put your hands like this and answer me. <laughs> because I will start one conversation if somebody is talking next to me, I can hear that conversation while I'm talking to him, and I'll be involved in that conversation, but I'll be in a conversation behind me too. So I hear all of them at the same time, and I'm taking them all in simultaneously. I know that sounds odd, but I do. And so time is odd with me. It, there's no like, here, I start here, I go there. Um, I kind of very fluidly go on whatever journey in my studio I connect with at that moment. I have so many pieces going all at the same time. And I'll jump from one to another. And there might be a piece sitting in my studio that I've been working on for eight years, off and on. And one day I walk in and it's like, I re-engage with it. And it may come to fruition, but, or it may not for another two years. And I don't care, you know? I think my Achilles heel, and every artist has an Achilles heel, is that sometimes it's hard for me to really say, I'm ready to let something go out into the world because I'm such a tough critic on what I'm doing. And I never want to put anything out unless I feel like I don't want I don't want something to haunt me where I go, why did I put that out into the world? Why did I let that go out into the world? And answering something that you didn't really I think of these pieces as my children. You know, they, they're an extension of me, and I really look at it very clearly that way. So when you have things unfinished in your studio, and you're at the end of your life, you're gonna have them all destroyed, <laughs> so no one gets to see them? Uh, never thought that far. <laughs> I, did, I did say to Robert that I wanted him to um, take my, uh, ashes, put them in a sculpture, and donate them to the Met. <laughs> in the Egyptian way. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, Terry's gonna say that, go Terry. Um, well, I was gonna ask a question, but I had to make a comment first. Yes. So, I would push back on all of you about the, the metal hybrids, because, Rob, you know how I, I see them as not embryonic in the thing that's not yet been formed but they're in a kind of place or space that's, bef that's after the time we're looking at them. <clears throat> they're in the future. Mm -hmm. There's this, oh, this, know, yeah. this kind of form of something that is after where we are standing 
when we're looking at one of them. And you know, I got into this whole thing about like radical evolution, right? <coughs> I wrote this text about Rona and, and when remembered how we get the word mesmerize is from a quasi-scientist from the time I think Louis the Fourteenth. Louis Mesmer, who had this notion that, mes that there were flu magnetic fluids in the body and that the body was impacted by magnetic fields and this fluid sort of moved through and, and that that's what we've left with now. It's the word mesmerized, which I thought was so interesting. It translates to this phenomenon of what it means to be mesmerized by a sculpture. So I think there's this way that, that that's why I think the show in, in Worcester was so amazing because this kind of idea of no time and all time, and there, you know, this whole de Kooning's cliched idea of all art is contemporary art. You know that it's everything is of the moment we're looking at it, and of the moment that hasn't yet happened. Um, the sort of nowness relative to maybe a future way of seeing something. I'm not discounting that there can't be an embryonic sort of form or that idea because making does happen in directional ways, but we're past that now once the sculpture's out. In the sculpture sort of in this place that time gets very complicated. So that then leads me to the question I want to ask you, Rona, because I, not, I didn't get to see the show in New York, and I'm looking forward to the one here. Having, I've known Rona's work for 30 years. Um, you know, I also have this idea about your sculptures are always about sort of sculpting the space they're in, too, even though you're not making them in a site-specific or site-relational way. Right. But there is this this idea of them. Always, I've always been so amazed by how they can be so classically sculptural, like the idea of the object. But somehow they are sort of doing things sculpturally to the space they're into. So that the whole space becomes the sculpture when you see what, like the shows at Sonnebend when you put like one in a room. They're like the whole room was the sculpture, really. Charlie Ray talks about this a lot too, I think, but. With the new work, mm -hmm. it's more about the geometry for me, about the cubes or the ones that are encased, especially. Like, space seems maybe like it's going to be different now, then compounded with this opticality and all these things that are happening in that kind of visual <coughs> space. But now, what happened in New York? With the, the, did the space become a part of the sculptures? In New York too, or do, is the space now just in the sculpture? No, I think it actually it okay. still has. You know what I'm asking. Though, I like do. That, I do yeah. know what you're asking. I think the there are different ways they're spatially affecting the rooms, mm -hmm. um, but I st now it's light and color and form that's doing it, and it's doing it in a slightly different way, but it's. Yes, it's still happening. Okay, yeah. Because I think that that's always been the thing that it never got talked about because there is this way you can see your work as continuing a kind of tradition of sculpture that's almost against sight. Like it, you, you could put it anyway. But, but if you really think historically about sculpture, it's always sculpted the room or the space it's in, you know, like. You know, you go back to churches or whatever. I mean, that, right. you know, that, that you know that it's so important, and it makes me think of like your interest in like the fragment too. Mm -hmm. You know, like the Egyptian thing, and, and you know that, that like that you did that thing for the Met where you actually talked about how they were presented in the display at the Met. These fragments, of, you know, that that look finished. To you. I think I'm paraphrasing now what you said, but like. Well, the, we the, ne the negative spaces the negative, were yeah. as charged as right, the exactly. actual sculptures right. or the fragments were. Exactly. Yeah. But they're fragments that we don't necessarily even know why they turn into the fragments they are. Like, we, we don't yeah. necessarily know what the cause of their fragmentation was that made them the particular shape that then creates that particular negative space that you're so interested in. Yeah. So there's a kind of arbitrariness to that, but that, that's why... I remember you telling me that's why it's sometimes I think it's better to be an artist than to be like a curator in a museum where they don't like arbitrariness all that they don't they don't know how to handle it. It has to mean something. Or it means something in the way they want it to be. <coughs> it's the back to you getting just doing what you want and yeah. telling the rest of us to like. One more question. Um, since you started working or 
started showing in the 80s, um, we're able to see like more and more <coughs> hybrid, mutated bodies, weird things done with figures um, in animation and movies and games and stuff like that. But I wonder if you could talk about how, as a not necessarily as a creator, but as a viewer, how you feel about the separate space of walking around a sculpture, looking at, at sculpt at things that don't move, mm -hmm. watching the light move over their surfaces, like how that's a special, distinct experience, and how you stuck with things that don't move and why. And uh, oh, interesting. You know, I'm a lover of objects. Um, as much as I love painting, and I really do. Um, I walk into a room and if I see something that's an object that I love, I want to touch it. I'm the person that has, you know, the sign up, please don't touch, it's for me. <laughs> because the first thing I do is I go and touch it. I touched a Anish Kapoor piece, you know, where it was the pigment on the sculpture and pissed off Barbara Gladstone. And then I gave Le Long a heart attack because I walked over to a Wolfgang Live milkstone piece and I broke the bead. And the milk went pouring down two minutes before the opening. And everyone's like, who did that? I did. Um, <laughs> I hate to admit it, but I did. Um, objects are meant to touch. Tech, you know, they're, they're, they're about touch. You know, I want to touch this, it's soft. This isn't, you know? I love the properties of objects. Well, what about this, this tree that's on an island? I feel like nobody could ever touch it. Well, that really can't, you know, it's an interesting thing that you say that. Do you know why that happened? No, I asked. Well, because, so this was part of a big international exhibition at Sonsbeek in the Netherlands. And all the sculptures were going to be shown. <coughs> and here's this 10 foot tree. And they said, everybody's going to want to touch it. What do we do with it? And I said, well, we got to put it in a place where they can't touch it, but they can see it. So we had these million conversations, like what would work? And all of a sudden, I don't know whether the person who was in charge of installation said to me, is there a way that we can make it float? And I said, not unless you're Houdini. Um, and then I thought, wait a minute. That's a good idea. So I went back to the foundry, and the owner of the foundry is also an engineer, and I said, do you think we can build a structure that would let the thing stand? So then I went back to them and said to them, can you find a pond that's only eight feet deep? Because <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't want to build a structure that has to be like 20 or 30 feet right. tall for this. And so we had divers going into this horrible, because you notice you can't see through, it was disgusting. <laughs> it was really like, you know, mud practically. And we got this structure in for the tree. Now if you look at the tree, it's also installed indoors, not like that. Sometimes with sculpture, you have to think about the pragmatic world of like, how do you let it stand, or how do you put something out in the world that has fragile parts to it, and you know a kid's going to climb on it, and they'll probably hurt themselves. <laughs> so you have to decide whether you like that kid or not. I don't really care, but, you know, their insurance company did, so <laughs> I had to care about it. Um, so that's how that got out in the water. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Well, listen, I think that has been fantastic. It's as good of a place to end as any. Thank you very much, Rana. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for everybody online for joining us as well. And uh, come back. Yeah. <laughs>